Good morning, everyone. Um, I am about to share my screen. I don't know if I was introduced. I'm a pediatrician and an endocrinologist. Um, I work at Red Cross and for a long time worked at Wittesker, which is how I sort of started getting interested in this, because as an endocrinologist, I work with um, with uh, children and adolescents with differences in sex development. So um, this kind of felt to me like an extension of that, although obviously that isn't necessarily how it's experienced by the, 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 the people concerned. So here's my talk. I'm trying to make sure not too much is interfering with my slides. Can everyone hear me before I continue the statement of the century? Yes, please, we can yes. hear you. Yes. Well, thank you. All right. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, so um, I know I'm speaking to doctors and psychologists and counsellors and anybody else who's interested. So I'm going to quickly go through sex development, hopefully not so fast that I leave everybody behind, um, but you can always ask me afterwards. As, as, a, as a very simple thing, it starts out with when um, the sperm and the ovum meet and the genetics are then set in terms of what the, the indeterminate gonad is going to become. The gonad is going to become either a testis or, or an ovary or sometimes not either or both. Um, and there's quite a lot of genetics involved at that point. And then there's another whole bunch of genes that make sure the testis works a particular way and the ovary works a particular way and um, male hormone is made and female hormone or female hormone. Um, the differentiation during um, intrauterine life in, 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 in girls is, is a, a set of genetic um, uh, messaging sequences that are set off by there not being testosterone around and a particular gene called TRI, but that's a major oversimplification, but it doesn't matter. And then the um, the, uh, the, proceed, the the pathways for making test for masculinizing the fetus are well or for or for yeah masculinizing the fetus up to any point. Um, are a little bit more complex. And the things that change are the internal genitalia. So you get a uterus and ovaries, or you get Wolfian ducts and epididymis and so on. The external genitalia um, change in boys to accommodate the testes. And then there's something that's extremely poorly understood, but the brain, there is some brain imprinting before the child is born that may determine how they feel when they get older. Please stop me if I'm speaking complete gobbledygook. Um, after the child is born, the, there's a thing called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So it's two areas in the brain and the gonads, the testes or the ovaries, have a whole um, sort of stimulation, uh, suppression set of cycles, but they become very dormant until puberty which in most children is between 10 and 11, but some happen earlier and some happen later. That's mostly the physical stuff. But if you link it to how children grow up and start realizing that they're a boy or a girl or they're not sure what they are, and, and then as time goes on, they get a better idea of what these things mean if they ask and, they, um, and it's discussed appropriately for their age. And then... Um, becomes more um, and, and then um, becomes more nuanced as they get older and then when they reach adolescence um, generally the identity and the understanding of gender never mind the physical body um, consolidates or becomes the most distressing thing in their lives as we'll get to in a minute um, so uh, if I if the patient does not want to be examined, which is fairly frequent, and I, I really don't blame them, I show them these pictures to ask them to tell me where they are in terms of puberty. So one of the um, one of the statements in the guideline is that you should not be doing any kind of hormone replacement or manipulation until the patient has gone into puberty. So Tanner one, it's, it's called Tanner stages. There are other ones, but Tanner one is pre-puberty. And then two is things have just started to change. 
Um, and then if puberty progresses, the changes become more marked, as you can see, more in terms of, of shape than size and the distribution of hair in the different places. Um, the same time, um, there's a skeletal maturation, which is extremely important for, for health long term. And there are some cognitive changes which are being understood um, better and better. We also understand that those cognitive changes go on way past all the physical changes into the 20s. Um, and um, there isn't, there is some work looking at what happens when you start changing the hormonal milieu that was set up at birth and so on, but not very much. Um, so that's a, a whole area of study. Okay. Uh, just to go through, if you are going to consider giving a child with gender um, diversity hormone treatment or pausing puberty, one does have to be aware of when the puberty starts and what the changes are, if only for parents to be aware of it, because in actual fact, these children don't really need to see a medical person um, until this point, unless they have other health issues, obviously. I did have a dad who wanted me to tell him where to get an orchidometer so he could measure his own child's testes, but he was a vet, so I'm not quite sure if um, this is something for general use, although he seemed to think it might be. So it's important to know that um, a puberty in, in, a, in a birth assigned girl starts, is very evident because it's, it's sometimes they grow fast first, but the breasts are very much present. For boys, it's less obvious because the first thing that happens is that their testes enlarge and um, first of all, the average birth, was, well, the average cisgender boy isn't going to go advertising this except in certain circles and, 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 a, and a birth assigned boy girl is, is not going to be very happy about it either and might well hide it, but it's also something that takes a while to be obvious. Hair is easy, and then I've talked about growth a little bit. So the things that I land up doing, or I land up helping other people to do, because there are not so many of us, and we're all in Cape Town, which is far away from a lot of you, um, is we try to stop puberty when it's just started. So puberty starts when the body judges itself ready. Um, by weight and height and nutrition and various things that are not entirely easy to understand, that presume, but presumably it's ready for reproduction, even if that's not what anybody necessarily wants. And the hypothalamus switches on this gonadotrophin releasing hormone. The hypothalamus is deep in the brain, up behind the eyes, really literally in the middle. And then it stimulates the pituitary to produce luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, which in a girl, a birth assigned girl, will stimulate the ovaries to produce estrogen and progesterone. And that in turn provides negative feedback to keep the levels where they should be. But this becomes a cycle in girls eventually. In boys, the same two pituitary hormones cause the testes to produce testosterone, which also provides negative feedback so that levels don't go up. Um, further than they should. That's an extremely simplified view, but that's basically where we're going to work. So we are either going to suppress this function. Um, we are going to provide this in birth assigned girls and provide this in birth assigned boys. And in birth, birth assigned girls, we might also give things that stop this testosterone from having its effect. Um, uh, generally, I say it will depending on, on where I meet the young person, they're either going to go through puberty again, or they're just going to have puberty. And then those are the sorts of things that I, that we land up helping with too. And then we try and do the, all the promoting good health exercise, you know, have discussions about smoking, have discussions about um relationships and how they're going to be dealt with. I mean, a lot of this is overlapping with the mental health professional, but sometimes the, the physical stuff's important, weight, exercise, I'm trying to think which other ones I have, smoking, alcohol, and so on. But that's just general good health. OK. 
care. All right, so I've just put this up like this. I didn't mean it to come on, take so long to come up. But just to show you that a lot of people have put a lot of work into these um, into these um, guidelines. Um, I, because I'm a medical person, tend to use the Endocrine Society Practice Guideline, but it's always good to read SOC 8 because it has um, more information on mental health and, and um, intersectionality and all the other stuff that you guys have been discussing already this morning. So I'm going to be not referring to them so much, but most of the information I'm going to provide has come from these two sources um, with occasional forays elsewhere if I'm not quite sure how to use something. Um, any questions before I continue? Okay. I don't see any hands yet. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So this I've got from SOC8, but it's not particularly different um, uh, in the Endocrine Society guidelines, um, except perhaps an emphasis on the comprehensive biopsychosocial assessment, including relevant mental health and medical professionals. And in the case of young people, it's particularly important that who, wherever they live and whoever's caring for them, usually their parents, but not always, are involved and uh, involved as much as possible um, in terms of understanding, in terms of learning about what, how these things happen, learning that it's nothing they did and so on. Um, and then, and, and the only time one would not, would consider not involving them is if, it, if, if it's shown that what they're doing or not doing is harmful to the particular adolescent. And then we, we do have families where half of the family is somewhere else in the world, which can make life difficult as well. Although, uh, you know, nowadays with um, digital media and so on, that, that we can involve parents wherever they are, mostly. The comprehensive biopsychosocial assessment is very important and is um, one of the, the areas of controversy. But basically, once that's happened and everyone agrees the child is ready, then one might consider the treatment. Um, so at the first meeting um, with, with an endocrinologist, it's a case of we, it, there has to have been some kind of experienced assessment. Um, this is quite difficult resource-wise because not a lot of people are trained in particular, particularly to care for adolescents, but never mind adolescents with the autism spectrum disorder, which is a very big group um, amongst, trans, um, about, amongst gender diverse youth. I would then have to establish that this young person is healthy, um, or if there are any pre-existing conditions that may need additional attention or may cause problems with the treatment. So I've had a patient, for example, who's had a testicular cancer and I'm now giving estrogen and there's not really a lot of evidence out there for how safe it is. So I need to speak to the oncologist about what I'm going to be doing with the hormones and so on. Another young family where there was a history of clotting in the parent, a fairly rare condition. And so I had to consult and make sure those um, things were paying attention to. And then it's quite important to have realized that a young man is already smoking because in giving him testosterone is going to make that risk of, of, of um, clotting and so on that much more. So the discussion has to be had. Is there a family history of hyperlipidemia? Because once we start male hormones, that may come out, which it wouldn't have done yet and so on. We determine the stage of puberty either by looking if the patient is happy for that or from them showing us on those pictures that I mentioned. Um, most patients who are TANA2 are way under the recommended age of starting treatment of 14 or 16, depending on, on what, what um, works in the country and which recommendations are, are you following. Um, so we would pause puberty. We would give them what's called a gonadotrophin releasing hormone analog, which sounds Irish, but giving a really big dose of that tends to switch everything off from overstimulating it. So it is a stimulant, but it, the stimulation switches everything off. 
if the patient is more advanced in puberty, um, the, the GnRH analog is mostly um, used as a way of, of, of stopping periods in uh, birth assigned girls and in boys, but, um, but sometimes it's also helpful to give the young person and the family and everyone time to explore this thing, particularly for those patients who have only presented during puberty or late in puberty, um, which is this, this group that everyone's worrying about at the moment. Everybody who worries is worried about. I have to talk about puberty happening again if you've gone through it once and the things you want to take time. Some of the things you don't want happening are possibly manageable. It's mostly the acne. Um, and then I, I do have to tell people that more is not necessarily going to give them what they want. So if they live in a family full of women with tiny boobs, it doesn't matter how much estrogen I'm going to give them, they might not get big ones. That is going to then require surgery. But obviously some, some women respond very well to not very big doses of estrogen. So the drugs can only do what they can do with potential um, in the child's body. Okay, so I've talked about these are the criteria that have come up in SOC 8. Um, I think the main difference here is that um, so gender diversity and incongruence being marked and sustained over time has always been the case, but the marked and sustained over time, I don't think anybody says how much time, and this is where the patient, the, the young people who present during their puberty may need more time to have some discussion about when they're going to start treatment. The diagnostic criteria when a diagnosis is necessary for healthcare, and this is going to depend on whether people are using ICD-10 or 11, we're still using 10. And then demonstrating emotional and cognitive maturity is a, is, is, is a big ask on all of us because teenagers are not adults yet and have their own particular way of thinking, thinking but from 13, 14, 15 on, as, as, as those of you who are psychologists know and the psychiatrists know, they are starting to learn abstract thinking, consequences of actions, and so on. But it takes quite a long time for that all to become the ability to make mature adult decisions about things. Um, and so that has, has to be taken into account when one is thinking about whether this person can consent or not. Um, and uh, I must say, I've had quite a few parents who go, but they're a teenager, how can they possibly know this? And that's where it's really important to then give people time to think about it and discuss it. And of course, a mental health professional is really important in helping with this. Um, the mental health concerns that may interfere um, are an issue. I mean, I, I, Michelle had a patient who had been well, but had seriously deteriorated before presenting to her. And clearly she couldn't start estrogen when this person was almost psychotic. So sometimes, or they're so unhappy that they don't know what they want, or they fixated on a particular thing. And so a little bit more time needs to be taken. Sometimes, of course, starting the gender affirming therapy is therapy for the mental health condition. And that's what part of the discussion that we have to have before we start. And once again, they do have to understand that they may lose the ability to have their own biological children unless they have, um, in our situation, the resources to preserve either sperm or ova. Um, I work at state, so most of the patients that I see from, you know, who are state patients do not have this available to them. And there again, it says um, reach to 10 or 2. Um, okay, so the suppression, as I said, would be a negative, well, it's a big positive here, and then these receptors downgrade, so they get overstimulated and they just shut off. So the initial treatment sometimes can have a side effect. So, so in boys, it might cause a period. Um, in girls, nothing in particular. 
sometimes they, I mean, the occasional patient really feels that you've switched off their sex steroids and feels menopausal and miserable. Um, I, I had to abandon this treatment in one patient in whom it was so bad. But most patients don't like it for a, for a couple of doses and then by six months have stabilized out. Got to be a little bit careful about patients who already have epilepsy and who have cardiac arrhythmias. And so sometimes one has to check, do an ECG before you start um, if there's a risk. I've discussed the side effects. The main issue is expense. It's not, not um, approved by medical aids for this condition. It's quite hard to get it for easier conditions already. Um, just to give you some idea, these are the prices. Um, this is an extremely useful site if you want to go and see what things are costing if you're going to clicks or discam or something. It's not always completely accurate, but it helps. And then this is the thing you get from Sopra. Um, but you can see that the cost per month is a fair amount. Um, this is just to show you what the implants, which are available in the States, cost at some phenomenally ridiculous amount. It would be lovely because you put them in once and then a year later you replace them, but we don't have them. These are all available in South Africa. Um, I'm trying to think what else I can say about them. This is what we give our state patients. Um, they get it at a slightly less price than this, but not much because it's it's not um, state tender, it's buyout. Um, okay, the next thing is when the adolescent really needs to have actual affirming hormone treatment. So, um, and just, okay, sorry, the thing I've just realized, this treatment is reversible up to a point. Um, if it's been going on for long enough, the reversal might take quite long. And if this is followed with hormone therapy, um, with affirming hormone replacement, then the patient will not be fertile because a tan two child is usually not fertile. And so if you stop the puberty there and then start the other puberty without ever allowing the, the natal gonads to mature, there, there is no fertility. It's, so just something that needs to be discussed again and again and again. Um, because of the, um, the nature of decision-making in adolescents, I tend to say, look, you make the best decision you can with the information you have now, but I'm warning you, you might kick yourself when you're 30. So just understand that it won't be your fault, but it, it is possible that you might wish you'd made a different, difficult, different decision. Um, they're usually raring to go and have already decided what they're going to do about family, but it, it's still worth reiterating it. Okay, so here, sex hormone treatment, they're all asking for it pretty much the minute they're old enough uh, and seeing everybody around them having changes. So um, in a teenager, we generally start at low doses and increase if the teenager has already got as far as 10 or 4 or 5, we can increase quite rapidly. Um, if they're 16, for example, and have had no other treatment, if the patient has been on a suppressive therapy, then we definitely start low and try and mimic normal puberty in terms of the pace of change and so on. If um, uh, for, for the girls, it's a case of if you give huge doses of estrogen really fast, the breasts don't grow very um, normally. They are they potentially might grow um, an unusual shapes, which can be difficult to deal with later. Okay, and then we back to um, we've all agreed they've had this incongruence and persistence for a long time, and they understand what they're giving consent to. Um, bearing in mind that this is teenagers we're talking about. Okay. So this is this is in the the, um, the endocrine society guidelines and and the stockade guidelines have taken the age of starting this down to fourteen, which is um, which I think is more physiological because because most in 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 cisgender teenagers we would regard puberty um, as delayed if it hadn't happened by fourteen in in a boy and. 13 in a girl, something, not everything, but some kind of start of puberty. And if someone's been on luprolide for a long time, one starts worrying about 
needing the, the, the sex steroids for bone health. So I see that the new stockade guidelines are saying 14, although there are some countries that are not happy with this. And, and also, obviously, it's once again a whole discussion. Are you ready for this? Do you understand what it means? You know it's not going to be able to go away. Um, one of the interesting things, of, that's my comment at the bottom, is that, is that I know that adults have often lived as the gender they identify as for a long time, even before they get their treatment. But a lot of the teenagers want to have some of the physical changes before they do their social transition. And that I see isn't a criterion in any case. Some of the transition stuff is a criterion for surgery, but not necessarily for treatment. Um, and we, the, as I said, um, we give the hormones and we need to worry about side effects. So boys who give testosterone by injection or by gel, we don't have patches as far as I'm aware in this country. I had a good hunt yesterday and I still couldn't find any. Estrogen, there are a lot more different ways of giving it. If you have means, um, we in states tend to use oral. Um, and then there are guidelines for how to do the dosage, but they all start with ethanol estradiol at five micrograms, which we don't have. The only low dose estrogen that we have in this country, very low dose, is Premarin. Um, and then the other way to give a very low dose is patches. So that can be done. Gel is quite a new addition, and I'm not familiar with its use, but I'm pretty sure there must be a way to figure out how to use gel in small doses and, and start increasing them, because it is possible with testosterone topical gel as well, up to a point. The most important thing to follow up with testosterone treatment is the hematocrit, because if it goes too high, then the, clot, the, the risk of clotting becomes extremely high. And so um, one would have to adjust the dose then. Um, and then in, in women, it's basically watching the, the estrogen level, but one would watch the testosterone level in boys too. And then if one's using antiandrogens, there are other things to check. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. I've just got Time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in girls, we also um, should be addressing um, um, androgen effects. So see, I've forgotten to put that in here. So we um, so we use something called spironolactone, which is actually a diuretic, um, but also has uh, anti-androgen effects because the androgens and mineralocorticoids are similar. Um, at the moment, we've been using saproterone acetate from Cipla. There is another product from Bayer called Androcur, but because we've all been using the Cipla, I don't know if Androcur is available. And just recently, the saproterone acetate supply has also suddenly stopped. I haven't managed to find out why from anyone, just we don't have any at the moment, or it's running out everywhere that has stock. In boys, one of the very important things to do is stop bleeding, and all the options that are used for women who don't want to bleed can be used for boys, but obviously it's being sensitive about where you're sending them to get these treatments, so the family planning clinic is hardly the right place. Um, it needs to be a friendly GP or gynae or endocrinologist for that matter. Um, sometimes just giving the GnRH inhibitor works as, for that purpose. It's, it's very effective, but it isn't always the appropriate use. Otherwise, we can use depot um, uh, or oral progestogens at various doses. Um, unfortunately, we can't do anything permanent legally in South Africa until they're 18 because um, that would amount to sterilizing the patient, which we are legally not allowed to do until a, a, a young person is 18. Okay, Eesh. whoops, sorry. So this is just to give you some idea of cost, um, which I just went quickly updating. There's a bit of a disconnect between what the government thinks people should be paying and what's actually happening, as you can see. Um, uh, these are patches. 
uh, and the pack sizes for patches are usually about eight because they get changed two or three times a day. And you can use these tiny ones and cut them in quarters if you're inducing puberty. That You can use these 25 microgram one, milligram ones and cut them in quarters. Some patients really want to use injectable estradiol. Depending on where you read, some people say it's better, some people say it's the same, some people say it's harder to get the levels. Um, what's available in state is these things. And um, as far as I know, Elma's worked extremely hard to make this referable so they don't have to come and see one of us to do it, um, partly because it used to be a subspecialist only um, prescription. And then these are the spironolactones, really, really cheap. Um, Saprotra and acetate, not so much. Um, but a lot of patients find this extremely helpful. But at the moment, I'm having lots of discussions about, well, maybe I must rather give you more estrogen or we must up your, your spiral and actone dose, which of course then requires some monitoring. Um, but once again, none of this is covered. Um, well, spiral and lactone you can get. I mean, that is easy. But, but Andrew Kerr itself is not covered um, by medical aids. And um, even, even the most affordable one is not particularly cheap once you start using it every day. Um, testosterone. Um, so we've had this discussion about depot testo not being available because Pfizer wasn't manufacturing it and we don't know when it's going to be back and that's definitely the most affordable one. We've been using Sustanon, which also tends to come and go, but I, I suspect the Sustanon stocks got depleted when the depot testosterone disappeared. Um, I have had some patients ask me about Depotrone. Um, I'm not sure how much of that is available and whether that's also been depleted because people have found it because the depot testo disappeared. Androgel is not available in state. Um, it's a bit finicky to use in terms of giving small doses, but it is possible. And then at the moment in, um, in, in, in patients on full adult doses, we're using libido in state because that's the best option, but is also not a particularly cheap version of testosterone. So the monitoring I don't monitor the teenagers while I'm escalating their dose because I'm going to escalate the dose regardless of what the level is. Once they've reached what I would consider the bottom of adult doses, we start checking what the levels of either estrogen or testosterone are. So estrogen is a little bit easier because it, it can be done pretty much any time of day, ideally in the morning, but it and, 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 and relative to the dose, it, it's not serious. Um, the only thing being that if you are using Premarin, you, you, it's difficult to be sure what level you're actually getting. Some people do measure estrogen, I mean, estradiol on Premarin, but it, it's not as reliable as all the other estradiols. And it's the recommendation is not to go above a particular upper limit, which is the upper limit of in, in women, um, in cisgender women. Um, I forget exactly what it is, but it's it's in the guideline. Um, and then uh, uh, to talk to the discussion we had before, there are a number of articles out there about how to interpret these things, and I'm glad we're going to discuss it later. Um, if the patient has changed their identity, then hopefully the stuff will come up as the identity on their sticker or whatever they've given to the lab. But I noticed that one of the um, one of the guidelines are suggesting we should be asking for the normal ranges for both genders, for both sexes, and um, and then judging from there. The testosterone is a bit trickier because it depends which one you're on. So Pfizer, I mean, the depot, we were supposed to check the testo halfway through when we were giving it. The nibido you have to do just before the next dose. Um, the androgel has to be at least a week after you've started applying it. So it is important to check which testosterone it is and then do the testing relative to that. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to achieve. But then the same thing, I tend to check the testosterone levels. Um, if they are within safe, if they are within reference range, 
and the patient is happy, I don't change anything. But if they're wanting more, then if there is room in terms of going up within the reference range, which is quite wide for testosterone, then, then we try more. Uh, the other thing about testosterone is if you're going to give more, you don't give a bigger dose, you give a more frequent dose. And there are different guidelines and, and the patients will have looked it up and sometimes go home and do their own thing. I had one young man who was taking three weekly, went and looked it up, decided weekly was going to work better and it worked very well for him. He came to see me, we checked his, his levels and he was fine because some people start two weekly or weekly. I tend to start four weekly. It is an injection after all. Um, and then as the doses go up, sometimes the patients do get rather frustrated with having to get someone else to do it and learn how to do it themselves, which is a whole discussion in itself. Um, I've talked about other tests and then I've talked about managing acne and worrying about exercise and weight. There should be, but according to guidelines, uh, check-ins with a mental health professional. So some of them have enough issues, other issues that they they quite they need the counselling and the care, and most of them are getting it, although that's a scarce resource. Um, and then there is the occasional one who goes, oh, I don't want to go to group. I'm not the kind of person. I'm perfectly happy. Thank you very much. So then they have a, a, a check-in when they come for their endocrine appointment, and hopefully there's someone there to have a chat. And hopefully we are hoping in Cape Town anyway to be able to have support groups that run in our centre. That, that's obviously hugely privileged. I think that's it. I hope I have covered who gets it, when we start, what we talk about, how I give it, and how we monitor and hopefully land up with a happy adult. Thank you.